This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Please speak as you might to a young child or a golden retriever. It's an unfair game. They're schemers. Schemers trying to control their little worlds. The rich get richer, that's the law of the land. It's just money. Blasphemy! This is madness! I drink your milkshake! All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Milkshakes, Markets Madness. My name is John Kutzmita. I'm here with Brent Johnson. If you're new to the show or unfamiliar with the meaning behind the name, visit our website, milkshakespod.com. You'll get all the answers you need there. We are now doing two episodes a week, or that is the objective. This first midweek episode is kind of more of a uh, quick touch and go, and we're gonna try to keep it somewhat short. And after a couple very interesting uh, weeks and weekends, We've kind of had a calm one, so maybe we'll be able to kind of touch and go. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting, Brent, maybe we can kind of focus on, is all of the uh, dramas and chaos around the banking sector and the banking crisis and Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. We did see um, finally a handoff of the Silicon Valley Bank assets to another bank, uh, to First Citizens Bank. And I thought this was kind of funny because the CEO of First Citizens Bank, his name, <laughs> his name is Frank Beholding. Um, and sometimes I can't help but wonder that we live in this simulation. And so this morning I, I put a tweet out that said, always be closing. And then I referenced that quote to Alec Baldwin. And then I said, always be holding and reference that to Frank Beholding. So um, I think I need to change my name if I have any hope of developing significant banking wealth. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you see something like that, you do kind of have to like, you know, knock on wood a little bit and then like ch 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 check what's going on. The, the only way that it would be more obvious that we're in a, uh, a simulation is if it was holding, if it was Frank the holding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, the gloves are off. Sure. The gloves are off already. You know, speaking of hodling, yeah. you've, you've, you kind of had a little tit for tat back and forth with your, your Bitcoin friends the, the last couple of days. <laughs> Uh, so this was a good one. So listen, guys, I, I know the difference between Bitcoin and fiat currency. Trust me, I know the difference. But I was just kind of trying to be have fun. You know, last week I did this thing with Jeff Snyder and we talked a lot about the euro dollar. And one of the points that we made is the euro dollar was selected by the market. Nobody made the international community use dollars amongst themselves back in the 50s and 60s, where it really started was kind of a combination of after World War II, you know, the Soviet Union was holding dollar balances uh, for, for business in Europe, but they didn't want to hold it in American banks uh, because we were entering the Cold War. So they started holding U.S. dollar balances in European banks, and that's where the name Euro dollar comes from. But nobody made the Soviet Union do that. And from there, it just kind of branched out. And now we have this huge spider web of euro dollar transactions and euro dollar payment systems and all this stuff that goes all over the world and you know the fed does not regulate it they can influence it but they don't regulate it there's not a central channel that it flows through and so i just kind of you know to have a little fun tweeted out that you know the euro dollar market um it's not state sponsored um the free market chose it and it's decentralized and i said something to the effect that bitcoin maxi should love this <laughs> well they didn't love it john <laughs> So I don't know how many uh, I don't know how many uh, minutes or hours uh, may have been a few over the weekend spent going back and forth uh, with uh, the Bitcoin maxis. I even got into it with Safadian, who is uh, you know wrote the Bitcoin standard. So anyway, that was a little bit of madness over the weekend in the whole fiat versus crypto world or Bitcoin. They want to make me be very clear: crypto is not Bitcoin. Understood. Understood. So. I think it's funny, man, you have an affinity. I, I think of like Looney Tune cartoons, particularly, and maybe it's not Looney Tunes, but whatever, Tom and Jerry, something along those lines. When when the animals would get into a scuffle and it'd just be this like 
dust ball of like fists and cat screams and dog barks. And it would just kind of like tumble along and anyone who was in its path would get pulled into this dust ball of, of, of battling, right. Of fighting. And you do this so well on Twitter, but what I think is so good about it, I mean, any, anyone can kind of start, um, or aggravate the crowd, but what I think is so, so it's a talent, man. It truly is, is that you pull in these, these big swingers, right? So it's like, you know, it's a, it's a Peter Schiff or it's like, you're saying that, um, you know, whoever it happens to be the, the author of the Bitcoin standard or someone with a lot of call it influence. And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly there's so much attention on really is just kind of this like little dust ball you kicked up for fun. Yeah. I mean, and the, the reality, and then, then everybody kept saying, you know, you just don't understand Bitcoin. Well, you know, I think what was proven in my, in my opinion anyway, was that rather than me, uh, what was proven is not that I don't understand Bitcoin, but it proved that the, the Bitcoin maxis don't have a sense of humor because that's all it was. I mean, all they had to do was say, yeah, there's a few similarities, but there's a lot of differences. They didn't like that. Well, we talk <laughs> about this too, a lot. The, you know, the ideologies are really what gets people in, in trouble. Maxi anything as, as you just said to me before we started recording is, is something you're not a, a fan on. Um, yeah. I also think it's ironic too, because those who are the complete opposite of a dollar maxi, you know, everyone who c continually calls for the end of the US dollar, I think misinterprets your stance with the dollar milkshake theory. And it's not like you're this, um, you know, being a US, a US apologetic or at the end, think that the current system is fair. It's just understand the mechanisms at play and don't get your feelings too worked up and miss basically how this can ultimately play out. Now, with that in mind, we had this article or this soundbite, literally a quote, like things are changing for the first time in a hundred years or whatever the soundbite was between G and, and Putin. And I, I, I think everyone's just was so happy to grasp onto that. Like this is, this is the beginning of the end. And, and sure, maybe there is something afoot, but maybe it takes another hundred years. We, we, we really don't know. So with, with that also being said, it's ironic to me that the euro dollar market would have actually been born in Russia of all places, considering the hype around this, this China and Russia conversation. But before we get too far, and I, and I, we want to keep this midweek episode kind of focused, but I do think if you could, let's take a step back and maybe just give some clarity on what the euro dollar market actually is. And partly in terms of like Jeff Snyder's work, like why, what is euro dollar market? Why does it create such a huge systemic issue? That's ultimately yeah. dollar bullish in the near term. So ultimately what it is, is the terminology makes it very confusing. You know, even when I first heard it, I just assumed they were talking about euros. It was some slang term for euros, but it's not euros. It's essentially any dollar that exists outside the continental borders of the domestic United States is essentially a euro dollar. Uh, and, and there are huge U.S. dollar balances all over the world, Asia, South America, Africa, uh, Europe, all over the place. And the reason is, is because the U.S. dollar has become the global reserve currency, most people, most businesses, most financial services firms in one way or the other need dollars or save in dollars. And so it, it's kind of like it's become the common language amongst commerce throughout the world. You know, if somebody from Brazil flies to Kenya and they're going to do business, you know, if, if, if they don't speak the other person's language, you know, but they're in business, they probably each speak English. So English becomes the common language in which they do business. Now, it's not always the case, but it's just it's often the case. You know, English is the most common language used in global commerce and dollars is the most common currency used in global commerce. And so when when commerce takes place out th outside the United States and it's denominated in dollars, that's a euro dollar. That's a euro dollar transaction. Euro dollar credit has been extended. The reason it's important to understand is because in, I don't have time to get into this right now. At some point, we'll do this whole whole episode on this. But based on the design of the system, two things, ha one of two things has to happen either. The money has to be circulating at a rate fast enough to service all the debts and to make everybody whole on the transactions and the debts that are owed within the system. If that doesn't happen, then 
the central bank, in this case the Fed, has to come in and inject a new collateral into the system. The problem is, is in the euro dollar market, the Fed doesn't have jurisdiction outside the United States. And there's no entity outside the United States that can inject new dollars, new collateral, base money into the system. And so it's very important that the euro dollar system functions as far as the circulation. There is no reverse gear. That's the problem. Based on the design of the system, it must grow. It's like a shark swimming through the water. If the shark stops swimming, he sinks and he dies and he can't breathe. Same with the, with, same with the euro dollar system. If, or just really the whole monetary system. If currency is not circulating, the system seizes up and it dies. And so that's why it's important because, the, there is, because there is no entity outside the United States that can inject new base money or new collateral into the system. It ultimately comes back onto the Fed. But it's ultimately also why the outside, why the periphery, why the euro dollar market collapses before the core, which is the United States. Awesome. That was, uh, I know for some, for a very complex topic to do a, a, a flyby is not easy. I might add a little something to that too, as I conceptualize it in my head during, during this conversation. Um, the, it's almost impossible for a bank to survive a bank run, you know, based on how fractional reserve banking is, they, they're able to extend credit, let's say 10 to one. Right, so every dollar of deposits they can create ten. So it's it's the commercial banks that truly print money. We're not going to get into why real QE isn't money printing, and it ultimately needs to be facilitated through commercial banks. But that's the concept. They have the ability to lend and extend credit, and therefore expand the, the monetary base. So if you have a marketplace, any marketplace, any any monitor, uh, monetary monetary author, uh, authority or or any type of monetary system that's acting outside of the United States, they're still under the same fractional reserve rules. It's it's as you're saying, it, it, without endless credit growth, the system eventually collapses. Now, in the United States, when you have a bank run or you have a systemic issue, the Fed can come in with additional liquidity to plug the hole. And this is something that we've talked about before, and we'll continue to talk about is first, before you get worked up about central bank responses, make sure you understand the size of the hole. Um, and, and in this case, what we're dealing with right now, the hole is probably a lot bigger than people realize, partly because of this euro dollar market environment. But now if you're outside of the, of the purview of the Federal Reserve and you have banks and banking systems in the euro dollar market or anywhere outside of the US periphery, now they've extended credit and a denomination that they can't actually provide liquidity for if there's a crisis. So you end up having this bank run, so to speak, in a much, much more rapid pace, especially when you consider a lot of these entities were when the dollar was at its weakest the last, say, decade, that they were borrowing in dollars. And now that there's been this big switch and the dollar's much stronger, those dollar denominated loans are now much larger, much more expensive because of the fact that they're generating GDP and uh, revenue as a, as a nation in their own, own currency. So that hole is now actually getting bigger because as the economy contracts, they're also now struggling to fill that hole um, because the same amount of effort does less, uh, provides less of a result. And so that's where you kind of get this, this spiraling effect. And, and as you've said, and um, something that one of the things that always stood out to me with the dollar milkshake theory that I think people lose sight of is your argument always is, is that hyperinflation or the dollar weakening at a rapid pace is not what kills the dollar and, and breaks the system. It's the endless and out of control strengthening of the dollar. That's right. That's right. And, and, and because all, all systems are the same, you know, the, the monetary systems in each country around the world are the same. They're built upon the same concepts. And, but when those countries print, they're printing for their domestic economies. When the United States prints, they are printing for the whole world because the whole world uses dollars and uses dollar-based credit. And the, the, you're not going to have a situation where the core goes into hyperinflation before the periphery because there's just more demand for the core. Now, that doesn't mean the dollar can't go down. You know, and it's very possible the dollar goes down over the next couple of years. You know, I don't know for sure. What that would do is that would extend the game. That would mean that we're not going to have this big end game in the next year or two because the dollar going down allows the system to continue functioning. 
You know, it's again, as you pointed out, as the dollar rising is what causes the, the dollar, um, uh, the dollar rising is what, is what causes the system to, to seize up. And there, there's one thing I, I want to I want to I want to make sure I say this before I forget, because this was another just kind of a, uh, a, a crazy moment uh, over the last week. And that was, you know, the <laughs> the the central bank governor. Or I can't remember if it was the central bank governor or the president of Kenya. I mean, they've been having a huge currency crisis. Their currency just keeps falling and falling and falling. They can't buy energy because nobody wants their currency. They're having trouble getting dollars. Um, and so the, 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 the head of the, I think it was the head of the central bank in Turkey came out and said, we are now going to buy, you know, oil. We're going to trade non-dollar with, with Saudi Arabia. Um, but basically what Saudi Arabia, did, they, all they did was extend them credit. They're not actually going to be buying it with their own currency. But everybody came out and said, oh, this is another, you know, nail in the dollar's coffin. This is going to cause the dollar to go down. Well, first of all, if it does cause the dollar to go down, that doesn't kill the dollar, right? <laughs> that actually keeps the system going. And second of all, are we now taking financial advice from African monetary authorities? Has that historically worked out for people? But everybody was so excited to grab onto that because an African central banker said, get rid of your dollars. The reason he was telling his citizens to get rid of his dollars is he wants the citizens to exchange the dollars for their local currency so that he can then have the dollars and then go buy the needed inputs. So, you know, it, it, again, it's just one of these things where people grab onto these headlines without actually thinking through the next two or three steps. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, it, depending on when people are coming into this conversation, I won't make any assumptions that you've been with us, with us through the entire ride so far this year, but I would encourage people to go back and, and listen to some of those earlier episodes. Um, and, you know, look, we, we title the episodes, we give descriptions and write-ups in the episodes. So you kind of know what kind of conversations you're going to consume. So you can kind of go back and, and pick through at your leisure, but get up to speed on some of the things we're talking about here because these are kind of the themes we keep repeating in some form or another. This one in particular being, you know, don't be ideological. Don't fall in love with your what you think is going to happen in a religious way. And, and ultimately understand that you're when you start to gravitate towards something, you're going to start to see headlines that reinforce that bias and clickbait headlines are, are really good at doing just that. And you, you lose your open-mindedness about how some of this can play out. And I think that's always been, um, despite your ability to stir up that Tom and Jerry dust cloud, <laughs> you've always been pretty good at, at, at the end to kind of settle the match in a, in a, in a somewhat uh, civilized way. Now we're talking about, you know, the dollar, euro dollar market. And, and one of the themes of the dollar milkshake is in the end, there can be only one. And there's this battle between good and evil. Speaking of battles and, and people might be disappointed in us if we don't bring it up, we're approaching now the final four in the NCAA basketball tournament. Um, any thoughts on that? Because it's been a bit of a, a wild tournament so far. You know what? It's it's been crazy. And the funny thing, you know, the last couple of weeks have been kind of crazy in the markets. So crazy. In fact, this is the first year in probably 40 years that I did not fill out a bracket. And I didn't even really look at a bracket until the Thursday afternoon when the tournament started and games were already going on. And and I just remember thinking that uh, there's so many good teams. And I, I even if I had filled it out, my bracket would have been busted within a day or two. And there has been so many upsets in this tournament. And then like, the, it's not even Cinderella's. It's like, you know, these teams you've never even heard of. And then, you know, they will beat somebody and then somebody else will knock them off. And then, you know, we've got Florida Atlantic is in the tournament, is in the final four and Miami is in the final four. Now these are the two schools from Florida, which is a hotbed football state, not traditionally known for basketball. I mean, like about 10 years, 15 years ago, Florida, University of Florida had a very good team, but in general, Florida is not necessarily considered a, a hotbed of basketball, but now we have two universities that are about 100 miles from each other playing in the Final Four, which is pretty cool. And then we've got San Diego State, which, you know, they're a good school, but nobody thinks of them as a, as a necessarily a basketball powerhouse. And then, but then we have UConn. UConn didn't have a huge, uh, didn't have a huge ranking, uh, but they're traditionally a very good school. So they're kind of the, the favorite to win it now. But I, I, I can't wait to watch the Final Four because the, the I didn't watch the first round too much but last weekend's game i watched a lot and there, there was just so many so many great games so many great upsets 
and so many great stories, uh, individual stories, that it's actually been one of the more enjoyable tournaments because of all the upsets. Yeah, everyone loves a good underdog. Um, since you weren't able to complete a bracket this year for the first time in a long time, I suggest I have an idea for you. Um, now that things, at least for this week, seem somewhat calm, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, but um, maybe take a minute in between starting fights with Bitcoin maxis <laughs> and maybe create a bracket for the monetary system. Um, you can oh. include Kenya in there. Why not? Uh, Turkey, obviously the dollar, Bitcoin, maybe even Ethereum to get some, uh, you know, some variety, but contemplate that. I think that'll be a fun experiment. Um, pass that around on, on Twitter and see what kind of madness, um, comes from that. I'm sure people will be losing their minds over it. So it's worth the effort, but, not um, a bad idea. yeah, I'll keep an eye out for that. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure that'll be a, a fun one. I'm, I'm evilly rubbing my hands in excitement. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, Brent, look, we're at the 20 minute mark. I think this is a good, um, fun little conversation. I think we spent a lot of time chasing the headlines ourselves on these podcasts because things have been moving so quick. It's nice to slow it down a little bit and add some context to an idea like the euro dollar market. So when we're going forward and referencing it, it's not this like vague idea or, or word that no one really can connect the dots with. So I appreciate your insight on that. For everybody who's new or old or just feels like looking at more of our episodes and content, vis visit MilkshakesPod.com or go to Twitter, MilkshakesPod, and also on YouTube, the same handle at MilkshakesPod. And we look forward to speaking with you in a couple, day, couple days for our normal uh, end of the week episode. Brent, any last words? No, just stay safe out there. You know, we've got a few days that have been a little bit more calm. So hopefully everybody survived the chaos over the last couple of weeks uh, because I don't think it's going to last. You know, get, get, get some rest while you can. Enjoy the calm before the next storm. All right, everybody, we'll talk to you soon. Hey.